Greetings from University of Texas, Austin. Sorry about what happened with the other video. I forgot that it has a 15 minute cutoff and so it kind of ended sort of abruptly. So I'm gonna to try to pick up where I left off. We were talking about Lyme disease and talking especially about the major host for Lyme disease, which is the white footed mouse, this little guy. And um, there are many species of mammals that can carry the bacterium that causes Lyme disease, but the white-footed mouse is the best reservoir. That means that the bacteria survives really well inside the white-footed mouse, so that if a tick bites a white-footed mouse, it's likely to pick up the bacterium that causes Lyme disease. Um, all the other mammals that, that may be infected with Lyme disease aren't as good at um, for the bacteria's life cycle as the white-footed mouse is. So while the bacteria might grow inside their bloodstream and maybe be able to infect a tick, it doesn't happen as commonly. They're less likely to ca carry the bacterium. Um, so this plays an important role in the likelihood that a particular tick will be carrying Lyme disease or not. Um, and that has to do with how their life cycle progresses. Um, as we said before, the eggs are not infected, so they hatch out as, as larvae, um, as uninfected ticks. They can only become infected with the bacterium that causes Lyme disease if they feed on something that has the bacterium in its bloodstream. So if they feed off of a white-footed mouse and that mouse is infected, then they're going to be picking up the bacterium. But if they feed off of something else, they're less likely to be picking up the bacterium. Or if they feed on a white-footed mouse that isn't infected, they won't get it. So some proportion of the larvae at that point get infected. Um, after they get their blood meal, they drop off and they go through metamorphosis and they turn into nymphs. They need another blood meal after the winter passes. So they look around for, for blood meal. And this is the most common way that humans get infected because many of those nymphs have become infected by feeding off of a, an infected white-footed mouse during their larval stage. If they jump on a human at this point, the human has a really good chance of catching Lyme disease. One of the reasons that they are so likely to catch Lyme disease is because the nymphs are very, very small. And so if a nymph is crawling around on you, you're unlikely to notice it. Um, you could also be infected by an adult tick because once the tick is infected, it's infected for the rest of its life. And the adults are known to jump on people as well as deer and dogs and, and other largish mammals. Um, but you're less likely to get infected from an adult because for one, they're bigger, so they're easier to see. You're more likely to notice it and get it off of you. Um, the second thing is that they have to be attached and drinking your blood for about 24 hours before the bacterium makes its way into the salivary glands of the tick and then out through the saliva of the tick and into your bloodstream. So um, that process takes quite a few hours and you're more likely to notice an adult that's been attached to you for 24 hours and get rid of it before that happens. A nymph, on the other hand, is so small that it could go unnoticed easily for that long period of time. So Lyme disease has been increasing in prevalence and um, a lot of people have been infected. It causes some serious health consequences. So there's been a lot of interest in looking at what we can do to decrease the incidence of Lyme disease. And what we found out, what some mammologists have discovered, is that Lyme disease is influenced by some ecological factors. Uh, the first is sort of obvious. Um, acorn production is linked to increases in white-footed mice. So when there's a lot of rain one year, the next year the trees produce lots of acorns, the acorns fall on the ground, the mice find the acorns, they eat lots of them, they're in really good shape, so they have lots of babies, and the babies survive because there's lots of food around. So the number of um, white-footed mice goes up drastically. And as the number of white-footed mice go goes up, the number of animals that can potentially carry the bacterium that causes Lyme disease also goes up. So when those tuck ticks are running around looking for a small mammal to feed off of or a small animal to feed off of, they find lots of white-footed mice, they jump on a white-footed mouse and start drinking its blood, they get infected, and down the line you get infected. Um, the other factor that affects the likelihood that a particular tick will carry the Lyme disease bacterium and 
because of that be able to infect humans uh, is related to small mammal biodiversity. And this is because the white-footed mouse is the best host. Um, other potential host species are much less likely to have the bacterium in their, in their bloodstream. So if there are lots and lots of different kinds of small critters for the tick to feed off of, then the likelihood that a tick will pick a white-footed mouse is sort of low, and that means that only a small fraction of the ticks are going to carry the bacterium that causes Lyme disease. So any of the ticks that fed on this one may be infected. The ones that fed off of any of these other species may not be affected, infected. Um, as biodiversity goes down, then that decreases the options for the tick. So very often what happens in disturbed habitats, disturbed habitats meaning places where humans are found, where there's been a lot of cutting down of trees or, or agriculture or putting up sub, um, subdivisions and stuff like that, uh, anything that changes the habitat drastically because of human intervention. What tends to happen is that mammal diversity goes way down and there are only a handful of species that do really well when humans have disturbed the habitat. One of them is the white-footed mouse. The other one is, is the white-tailed deer. So a lot of these species disappear from the ecosystem when humans come around and because of that the only things left over are species that are good hosts for the bacterium that causes Lyme disease. So the ticks are much, much, much more likely to be infected. And once they're infected, if they jump on a human, then they're likely to pass the disease on to humans. So keeping biodiversity high is one way of keeping the incidence of Lyme disease low. We're going to move from here to talking about one other case study which is something called a meningeal worm and this is a kind of nematode a sort of worm um, that is parasitic it lives its life cycle inside a couple of different host species the mammalian host is the white-tailed deer so it's found very commonly in north america in the deer that run around in your backyard um, here's what it does in its life cycle um, where's a good place to start i don't have my glasses on so i can hardly see what this is um, so let's start um, at, let's see, I'm going to pause. I'm back. I have the glasses. Um, okay, so let's start with, well, where they normally live. Um, they normally live around the meninges of the brain. This is a cartoon picture of the brain of a deer. And the meninges are, are the um, layers of tissue that surround the brain, and the worms live right under there, right next to the brain. And as adults, they lay eggs. Um, they lay eggs in, in the brain here, on the outside of the brain. And when the, the eggs hatch, they turn into larvae, and they go through the blood circulation um, to the lungs. They kind of irritate the lungs, so the deer coughs them up, so they come up through um, the oral cavity. And then they're swallowed back down, so they're coming up from the lungs, um, down into the stomach, into the digestive tract. Eventually, they pass out of the digestive tract in the feces. So at this point, they're down on the ground, and um, the snails and slugs are running around on the ground, and they uh, pick up these larvae. The larvae kind of work their way into the bodies of the snails and the slugs. And the snails and the slugs are wandering around. They're eating grass and stuff on the ground. And so is the deer. So the deer is also eating grass. It's picking up grass that has snails and slugs on it. So it's swallowing the snails and slugs. And that goes down into the stomach of the deer. Once it's in the stomach of the deer, the slug or the snail's body is digested away, but the larvae are still there. And what they do from there is they find a nerve ending from the stomach and they follow that nerve ending to the spinal cord, and then they work their way up the spinal cord back to the brain. So that's how they complete their life cycle. They, are, they have co-evolved with deer. So deer live with these all the time. You can't tell that they have them. It's no big deal for the deer, um, and they just you know, mutually coexist. The problem comes when other animals, other herbivores, eat the grass that has the slugs and snails on it that are carrying these um, brain worms. 
and they have not co-evolved with the brain worms, so the brain worms cause um, terrible um, side effects for them. So when they eat the sl snugs, slugs and snails, uh, the same thing happens. It gets to their stomach, they, they travel up nerve endings, they go to the spinal cord, but they do damage to the spinal cord as they work their way to the brain. So these animals have um, progressive paralysis, they walk in an uncoordinated way, and then they eventually, within a few days, die. So here's a picture of, of where they live normally. This is um, a cross-section of a skull, so this has actually been cut open with a saw. So this is the inside of the cranium here. Here's brain matter, um, and this picture is showing you where, where there's a worm uh, that's inside the cranium. All right. Here's another picture of what happens in a species that has not co-evolved with the meningeal worm. So the worms are migrating through the spinal cord itself instead of just on the outside of it. And so as they do this, this is the spinal cord, the arrow is pointing at the worm, and you can see it's kind of embedded itself in the spinal cord. Um, and when this happens, it's causing damage all the way up and down the spinal cord so that all the, the nerves that are running through here are disrupted, and that has repercussions for, for coordination of movement. So I ran across this uh, when I was doing my PhD and my postdoc at the National Zoo's Conservation Research Center in Front Royal, Virginia. And this is basically a big farm that breeds exotic species. So exotic ungulate and antelope species and uh, things like bison and zebras and Przewalski's horses and all kinds of stuff. Um, there are lots of non-ungulate stuff too, but I most, mostly work with the ungulates. Um, and it turns out that many antelope species are susceptible to this meningeal worm. Um, and it was a very difficult uh, problem to solve in Front Royal because there's tons of white-tailed deer. They're all over the place. They can jump incredibly high. They have, I don't know, eight to ten foot fences and the deer just hop over them like there's no fence there. It's really, really hard to keep spacing between the deer and, and the exotic ungulates that are, that are being bred there. And they're mostly rare and endangered species, so uh, great care is taken to, to preserve their health. So they undertook a, a very serious um, set of preventive measures to keep this, this parasite away from the exotic ungulates. Uh, one thing they did was to try to step up their efforts to keep the deer away, because the deer are carrying the parasites normally, and that's one way that the parasites could get into the grass where other ungulates could eat, eat the parasites. So this involved um, making fences that were not deer-proof, but um, deterred deer from getting in and made it easy for them to get out. So they were sloped away from um, the direction of, of the, the exotic ungulate so that if so that the deer had a hard time jumping in, but if they did get in, they could go out pretty easily. Um, they also removed deer that got into any of the pastures and they did a variety of population control measures like uh, looking at different kinds of contraceptives for the deer so that there were fewer deer around to get close to the ungulates. Um, another thing they did was to keep out the snails and slugs. So they put big gravel buffers outside of all of the pastures that had exotic ungulate species in them. And actually this was incredibly effective. It turns out that slugs and snails don't like to cross um, non-vegetated ground. So they just put down about a 12-foot gravel path around the outside of all the fences, and the slugs and snails didn't, didn't cross that. They also use a molluscicide on the inside pastures. I didn't even know what a molluscicide was, but insecticides kill insects, molluscicides kill mollusks, um, and so that's effective against slugs and snails. And then finally, uh, they found some dewormers that were pretty effective and worked over a long period of time to kill the larvae uh, before they could work their way through the, the um, spinal cord of the exotic species. And so they, they use preventive worming measures now to, to, to keep the incidence of this disease down. All right, so that's all the stuff on parasites that um, we're going to cover for the final exam. We're going to be having a review session on Wednesday, I think it's May 15th, the day before our final exam. I'm going to post the location and the time 
on Canvas, but it's going to be 4 o'clock in room 1119, Plant Science.